Polaris in the comic books recently is depict it with her coffee. Like, what is your ideal morning coffee situation? When I do drink coffee, it's a black coffee hot with one Splenda. And I believe that's also what Lorna would drink in real life. A daddy cable. Daddy cable. I would, I would love that. I would love. It. Shout out to the Powers of X Men podcast. I was writers at Marvel Comics right now. The pretender's death, like be. Alright, Familia, Power of X Men, we're with. Hi, I love that. Do you love Power of X Men? I love Power of X Men. Of course I do. Do I? Yes, yeah, I do. Yeah. Familia, we have a really special episode today on Power of X Men. We have Stephen E. Gordon who was the lead character designer and director of a couple of episodes of X-Men Evolution. I was about to say Wolverine and the X-Men, of which he is part of, <laughs> but but X-Men Evolution primarily. And we're going to get into that conversation, but we have a very special co-host for this episode, our friend Cody. What's up, Cody? Hey, Paul. How are you? Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, no, well, it's funny. I was like, who here is an X-Men Evolution fan? And you responded to my DM and you're not just an X-Men Evolution fan. You're like a crazy stan. I love it. I, I don't think it was one of those where it's like, I, you know, I, we, we talk quite a bit, I think on social media. And I think seeing you comment about that, I was like, oh yeah. Like, but it's also like, does he really like this? Or is it just like how he likes all X-Men things? But X-Men Evolution is like, pro- it, it's up there with, with high X-Men, X-Men loves. It's so interesting because I grew up in fourth grade watching X-Men, the animated series, and you in fourth grade grew up with yes. X-Men Evolution. It was the the animated series, I think, was now officially wrapped and the movie, the, the Fox movie was dropping. And so they were re-airing X-Men, the animated series episodes, which I, I loved and ate up. But then when X-Men Evolution dropped, it was like, this is it like this is this is my show this is so cool um i'm i'm a big cyclops guy and i always get made fun of from my friends who just think he gets hit all the time in the (laughs) x-men the animated series but then going to x-men evolution it's like oh yeah this is why this is where my cyclops love truly truly comes from well it's such a great version of the the character i'm always going to remember that scene where it's, I think it's blind alley where Mystique yeah. is coming after him. And then jeans like comes and saves him. And she's here. Like, I don't know why I knew. And he's here. Like, you don't need to explain it. Mm-hmm. We have the special rapport. And that to me is like Scott fully realized as a character. It's certainly not the Scott we have in the comics and certainly no, not yeah. Scott in other iterations, but we we've known each other. We, we met at San Diego comic-con last summer, last summer. Yeah. I, did so, I randomly come up to you or were you, did you see me and then you came up to me? I don't remember. I saw you. I think we had been friends on yeah. um, Instagram for a while. And I was like, I'm pretty sure this is the the power of X-Men guy. <laughs> and, and so it was right after the, uh, the Marvel animated panel. I think we were both like waiting out for our significant others outside of the bathroom. And I was like, yeah. Hey man. And then I think that's where we started talking. Okay. Good. I thought I probably came up. I got ragged on recently on the podcast. I go up to people and I'm like, Hey, what's up let me ask you a quick question about the action in people's faces but i remember us having a far more pleasant interaction more, yeah human conversation human conversation yeah. instead of me good. shoving the phone in your face but you also have a big presence in the x-men community you're doing your own thing as well well yeah so i um i love i love comics um i loved comics for a long time and then my friend riley and i we were co-workers when i'm uh, when i'm not reading comics one of my jobs is i'm a i'm a teacher i'm a media and performing arts teacher and so um me and the choir teacher at the school i worked at i started lending him some comics around the times of uh, avengers endgame and then i got him hooked too and it's always really good to share your addiction with someone else mm. um, so you don't have to feel as bad spending money on wednesdays when comics drop mm. um and then together we just started uh our own podcast uh 
mortal mortal x friends um so we are we are slowly uh having our our x-men podcast where we talk a lot of a lot of things krakoa a lot of things jonathan hickman um and but slowly trying to branch out into into more as as he reads more and kind of catches up but uh yeah i love that i'm a also a screenwriter uh, and director. And so comics keep me sane uh, in the midst of my own storytelling avenues. And so it's always one of those big things where it's like, at the end of the day, I can go back to X-Men and that can be my like true North on if I'm being an honest storyteller and writer. Yeah. It, it, I have to tell you, Immortal X friends. I, I, I just want to say Immortal X-Men. Uh, the way it comes <laughs> out, you guys, did Sin- sense of sinister you did hox pox i mean yep. you guys are tackling those those really contemporary stories that for it's, it's funny i have been back with the x-men since morrison which we talk about in yeah, this interview. yeah so it's always so weird for me that when people engage with power of x-men in our community they're like oh i just started reading the x-men with with hickman and Again, it's so mind blowing to think that there's this whole new generation of new readers. So I think what you're doing there, like bring, breaking down these stories and making it digestible, it's just it's an awesome vibe, man. Well, thanks, man. It's cool. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's yeah, it's fun, and it's I, I cannot imagine if the same way I can't imagine if Hawksbox was my intro yeah. into X Men, and so it's one of those where it's like it is a lot of intro for people that only are familiar with the movies or X Men Evolution, and so trying to make that easy to understand to there's a lot of great modern stories and i think that's the conversation that i most often end up having with with fans that will reference dark phoenix or days of future past or extinction agenda and being like hey actually like this is really good too right now yeah so trying to bridge that well you know what's really good this interview with stephen (laughs) gordon because he he told us a lot of of tea here a lot of tea Confirm yeah. some things, deny, debunk some things, not denying. I mean, we did ask him if X Men Evolution was being revived, and he said no. I don't believe him. The Lee Waltz and like Larry Houston told us no. X Men ninety seven wasn't going to happen, and it did. So, but no, I think one of the things that he said here that was really interesting was there was a lot of Buffy reference. They were big Buffy fans, and that kind of. Are you a Buffy fan? I I don't know. I am I'm- a Buffy fan. Yeah, I'm a Buffy fan. Um, I I came to Buffy in. I I wasn't I wasn't allowed to watch. Oh, you Buffy weren't old when I was enough. Younger, I was one of those. Yeah. So so what's weird is I actually I found Smallville first and then Buffy and then realized like wait a second like like these are the same. Um, but I came to Buffy in college and and that's where I got to fall in love with it. Yeah, I mean we see. I, I we will let our our, our listeners today figure it out um, as, as I go through the interview, but it, it's interesting to see how much of Buffy influenced evolution because yeah. the genesis of what they wanted to do was they wanted to tell a high school story a la Buffy. And I think that sort of comes out, but yeah, he told us some characters may have been in the closet initially and the way they kind of saw it. There was one character in particular that they wanted to build the entire series around, which has inspired yeah. so many people. And we of course have to ask about, Laura Kinney, aka X23, aka the best Wolverine right now. So the Wolverine, yeah. The Wolverine. But anyways, wait, wait, why don't you intro the episode? All right. Power of X-Men listeners, get ready. <laughs> get ready for our X-Men Evolution interview starting right now. Steven, we are so excited to have you here today. How are you doing, man? Good. Most very good. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Well, we both Cody and I, we love X Men Evolution. Cody, I didn't know you were that big of a fan of X Men Evolution. So much. It's um, I I think I'm a little younger than you, Paul. And so, like, while the animated series was like my intro to X Men, when X Men Evolution came out, I think I was fourth grade. So it was like these were the teens that I wanted to be. And uh, when my wife and I first started dating, I realized how big of a fan she was too. And that was a big, big part of our early, early courtship was bonding over goth rogue and Scott Summers and how these versions <laughs> should have ended up together. But, you know, nice. controversial. Nice. Glad, are you... glad to have uh, been helping your courtship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, are you aware of the amount of shipping that goes on for goth rogue and Cyclops? Yeah, well, I don't know about the amount. That's hard to say. But yeah, I knew that there was uh, quite a bit of um, fan uh, exploration about that, and I liked yeah. it. Yeah, you know, we we kind of that was one we kind of set up ourselves. You know, some of the other 
others we weren't quite aware of. You know, obviously the Kitty and Lance one we knew about. Yeah. Lancity and <laughs> Lancity. Um, yeah. <laughs> Wait, yeah. I've never. Have you heard of Lancity before, Co- uh, Cody? Yeah, I have. I thought that was that was another one. I remember watching that young and be like, "Oh my gosh, you're gonna get with the bad boy! Like this is this is amazing." Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. funny. It came to me. Yeah, I'm a little older than you, Cody. Um, X Men Evolution came to me when I was about those characters ages. Like I believe okay. I was probably graduating when Gene and Scott were graduating. <laughs> and so they went from being like the like the X Men versus the, you know. The ones I had grown up with, they became more contemporaries in my eyes, and like I could relate to them a bit more in their struggles. So, we we Good. we have tons of X Men Evolution questions for you, but Stephen, just to get you get to know you a little bit more, when did your passion for animation begin? Uh, well, I don't know if it was passion so much. I mean, I kind of fell into it by accident. I was not <laughs> intending to get into animation. That was not my goal when I was in high school. When I was in high school, I had uh, been planning into getting into, getting into illustration and stuff, and I kind of fell into animation by accident and have stayed here ever since. So, wait, how how does one accidentally fall into animation? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was in high school, I uh, was getting my portfolio ready to start sending to places like Art Center in Pasadena and other places. Uh, for illustration and just art in general. Uh, and uh, my art teacher, who was kind of guiding me along, was uh, had come across a um, ad in a trade paper. I, I'm not sure. I think it was Variety, maybe, or something. I'm not really sure. Maybe it was an art paper. I really don't know. Uh, and it was asking for portfolio submissions. So she thought it would be great for me to submit what my portfolio was at that moment and get a professional review of it and in some ways take a little of the wind out of my sails Um, (laughs) because you know you know in in high school there's always one person who's the art major or something and that was me the big art yeah i was the big art person i was doing the you know the yearbook and the newspaper and whatever else anytime art came up i was painting murals on the wall and whatnot, you know, it's kind of all over the place as far as art goes, so she thought it might be good to take me down a peg or two and make me realize <laughs> that I was just in high school. Um, so anyway, so as it turns out, though, I guess she wasn't as familiar with how things worked as she thought she was, even though she was actually a uh, working artist doing freelance and stuff, whatnot, uh, while she was teaching art. And it, you, anyone now could tell you no one's going to give you a uh, review if you submit a portfolio they either like it or they don't and usually if they review it it's more you know, more boilerplate like yeah you don't fit up to our expectations or yada 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 you know that type of thing and so she was wrong about that and she was wrong about the other two because i got the job <laughs> so that's uh, awesome yeah so uh you know i i my the wind got kicked out of my sales a little bit later once I met everyone else that was being hired too and realized that I was really probably on the bottom rung of abilities and qualities and stuff. But anyway, so in high school, they uh, uh, helped me get the job uh, by um, or accept the job by allowing me to uh, graduate with the rest of my class, but by taking the rest of the uh, classes through night school, adult night school and stuff. So because they were very excited because as it turns out, I think I was being offered more money than they were. So so that, that so I fell into it by accident. And even then I only expected to do it for this one project and then get back on track and you know head back to art school and stuff. But you know um but at the time one of the girls that I met there and started I dated a little bit uh, who was the actually she was in ink and paint but she was the daughter of a uh, you know a animation person from way back you know that from Disney and whatnot and so she was so and she said no trust me no one gets out of this once you're in it you're in it <laughs> and as it turns out she was right so that's how I fell into it by accident that's <laughs> awesome <laughs> 
what was it, if you can say what was that first project that yeah, lord you... of the rings okay, oh, okay. Oh. yes Ra- well, we Ralph have questions Bakshi. about that a yeah. little bit yeah Ralph Bakshi's lord of the rings yes that was an awesome first project to work on yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know I, it, everything kind of clicked into place it worked i mean i was kind of vaguely interested in the property anyways as far as you know i've been i read the books i tried to read the books i couldn't really get through them it, it was too dense for my taste and when i got hired i you know got into it more because you know fantasy was sort of my thing at the time yeah. even though those particular books were not but um so it was nice and plus you know, it was a great place to uh start out because you know he, if he saw ralph saw some ability he would move you up quickly mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. try to find another position for you or as positions opened he would put grab someone from the lower rungs like we were and move us into it so it, it's so interesting that that was your first project because i mean that movie i mean they played for they played it for me as a kid you know in the classroom before the movies were were out and till this day i have seen it and it holds up and it's so iconic what was yeah, it? it's not bad it's not bad at all. in fact I'd, I'd venture to say there are sequences in it that ralph made that are probably better than peter jackson's yeah I, I think you know like the death of Bormir. <laughs> i think his death of Bormir is far superior than peter jackson's and um you know there's and obviously peter jackson must have been a fan because there's many images and setups camera setups that he took directly from ralph so and, so know, I think someone on the internet has done some sort of comparison between them. I've like I've seen a I've seen a few of those comparisons. Yeah. They're yeah. they're yeah they're shocking. Yeah. Um, on that note, is there is there a particular piece of of animation, film, or TV that inspired you when you were younger to kind of lead you down that path? You said you're a big fantasy guy. Well, it, what I was into in fa- and as a younger guy, fantasy wise was like the Brooks of Ergras Burroughs and Michael Moorcock and. Uh, you know the Elric novels and the John Carter of Mars books and yeah. stuff like that, and uh, and obviously a, a huge fan of uh, Frank Frazetta at the time, as most you know budding artists were yeah. today <laughs> and stuff. So, uh, but when I did, this is all pr- prior to my seeing sending in my portfolio and all that. I went to see Wizards with a girlfriend at the time in high school, and I, that just floored me. I thought, wow, this is great. You know, because at that time, the only animation you could see was Disney, which had been com- increasingly getting more saccharine, you know, like with Aristocats and crap like that, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, or TV animation and stuff. So things had really kind of fallen apart. But, you know, when I saw Wizards, I thought, wow, this is, I can't believe that I'm seeing this, you know, you know with all those, you know, the stuff, Mike Plug's drawings at the beginning, the the drawings and all the, the handling of the subject matter and everything else. I thought this is marvelous. So, but I still wasn't like, gee, I gotta be into it. You know, get, <laughs> get into animation. I just thought, wow, that's really fantastic. I I've never seen Wizards before. I'm looking at it right now. Ralph also did that movie. Yeah, as well. Exactly. Yeah. Guys, so, gorgeous. I'm just yeah, I mean, it, well, it, it's it's a. It was him kind of doing a comedic take sort of on a, a Lord of the Rings type subject. You know, it's very much wizards and, but, you know, he threw in Nazis and he threw in, you know, it, you know it, if you're familiar at all with any of Ralph's prior works to Lord of the Rings, he, you know, he would definitely have a shotgun approach to storytelling and whatever worked for him at the moment he would put in. And that's <laughs> definitely got it, so. Is there a particular animated film that you think everyone out there should watch that you just think like when you see that it's so perfectly done, it is a masterpiece? Well, I, I think Pinocchio still really holds up very well. Um, I mean, you know, there's a few plot holes in it, but overall it's, it's a magnificent piece of animation and storytelling. Um, there's others too. I mean, there's a whole chain of them now now there's just so many films <laughs> it's hard to <laughs> narrow it down to uh one or two um but you know i, I think that was pretty good I, th- I think you know some of the latter disney films like mulan were real good um 
and you know, it just depends on what you're looking for in a film. Um, I mean, I, I'm not very traditional. You know, I wasn't a huge fan of Roger Rabbit. I wasn't, you know, I thought there were some other films that, you know, even Beauty and the Beast, I thought was good, but I thought had severe problems, especially in the animation and stuff and the design work. So, oh, really? You, you know, it's funny. I never thought about character layouts and design with animation until I, I they did a Sailor Moon revival and the models just look kind of off and I would do mm. deep dives. But it was an entirely different world I wasn't used to. My brother was going at the new school at the time and he was he majored in animation. Mm -hmm. And so he was explaining to me how character models work and all that. And it was something that just always evaded me. Sure. Well, and that's good that the general public doesn't get as nitpicky as people in the business. <laughs> you know. But you know, overall, I mean, you know, a lot of those films are great films, but it's hard for me to say, well, this is the perfect film because I see a lot of the, the actual mechanical problems and stuff, and, and even some story problems and whatnot. But, like even the first Toy Story, while a great film, the, the handling of the humans was so awful. <laughs> I, I came out of there thinking, boy, they should have just used humans and mm -hmm. matted them in. So, you know, obviously, that, probably a good thing they hadn't because that would have set up a weird precedent. <laughs> I'm they not follow. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, the, the first one was just like those humans who just looked like they were bought off the shelf, you know, and <laughs> pulled from Poser and stuff. You know what? I yeah. got to ask you about Titan AE. Please, like, please, <laughs> you don't understand. I was listening to Cosmic Castaway this morning on my jog. I mean, this is the film just hit me at the right time in my life, much like X Men Evolution. Hmm. So, what what was it like working on Titan AE? Well, well, let me clarify. Uh, I didn't work on Titan AE. I worked on it when it was called Planet Ice, mm. and it had a different director and a whole different. Uh, point of view and everything. I mean, we still had basically the same characters, a lot of the same characters. They weren't refined at the time I was on it, but yeah, at the time, it was um, a lot of a mess. You know, no one knew exactly what the story was. In fact, we had created a, uh, must have been like a 15-minute prison break sequence that just went. <laughs> and <laughs> even while we were doing it, we going, this film can't have that 15 minute prison break in it because, <laughs> you know, that, it's not about a prison break, you know, it's, but there are just all types of problems with it. But I, you know, I left before it got pulled and handed over to Don Bluth to become plant, uh, Titan AE. So my experience with it was only in the early, early development and story stages of it. So, but like I said, a lot of the main characters were, they weren't final but they were pretty much as they ended up being in the, the final movie. So that's well, thank you for laying the groundwork for that because I mean, the movie was one of my favorites in oh, my, good, my good. early teens. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it was one of Blue's best. I think frankly, if you look at his entire repertoire, it would be mm -hmm. Anastasia would probably be his strongest film just because it helped holds up in a lot of ways that most of his films don't, you know, as far as story and a romantic feel and actually getting from point A to point B without too many staggering moments in it. That, I mean, the only one in, in uh, Anastasia that I think is, is a very, very blues moment was the whole LSD trippy thing with uh, Rasputin. Yeah. <laughs> So that, that was very much blue, whereas the rest of it was, I think, was being forced upon him storytelling wise by uh, Fox and stuff. So, but I still think it's the strongest film overall. Technically, he wasn't bad, but it's got some weird trip, weird things in it that are <laughs> some weird, oddly unintentional homoerotic stuff that I don't think was intentional. <laughs> and, so. you, you, you have some credits on Anastasia as well, don't you? Yeah, I, I did some freelance animation on that film uh, from California. It was all done in Arizona, but uh, I, I don't know if I contacted them or they contacted me, but I did you know, probably about, I don't know, a handful of scenes, enough, I get, I think, to get a screen credit on it. So, so it was good. It was mostly rotoscope stuff at that time and 
whatnot. And I, I think I did um, a lot of the uh, stuff where she was um, dressed up in the black or the dark blue gown or whatever and stuff when she's being figuring out all the plot or whatever. I think I don't know something like that. It's been a long time since I've seen it. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I've seen it since it came out in theaters. Yeah. But it was, I mean, everyone in my neck of the woods loved it. Yeah. I mean, it was a strong film. It was much more uh, a princess romance film than <laughs> what he normally did. Even when he yeah. tried to do those, he had a lot of trouble on his own. Thumbelina, I think, was a a, a staggering mess. And, as, uh, that, that's one of my, my as a kid. I love Thumbelina. I watched that oh, okay. so many times. Well, yeah. I, I, well, <laughs> it, it, landed, it landed with the intended audience. Yeah. Of like, well, yeah. that's perfect. Then. I mean, it, it amazes me. Any film has got its legions of fans. It's amazing. You know, like I, I worked on Fire and Ice, and that film was a complete disaster as far as box office and everything else. But boy, I, when I go to conventions <laughs> and stuff, it's like number the number three thing people come up to me about and stuff. So, <laughs> Just so have I, no idea how it's going to land. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's also a lot of, depends on those fans that want, not fans, the people who saw it and saw it over and over, especially in the day of uh, video cassette and stuff the like VHS, that. VHS, baby. Yeah. 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 And oh. they just see it over and over and they just they lock into it if they're at a certain age and stuff. And then they grow up with it. I mean, you can say the same thing about a lot of live action films that are just really god awful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but, you know, people have fan, you know, it's like the whole, um, uh, Goonies thing. It's an awful, awful film if you watch it with an adult eye. But boy, it's got its fans and stuff. So, one hundred percent agree. Yeah. So, so jumping ahead a little bit, um, sure. this is awesome hearing some of the, the these stages of earlier on in your career. So, in twenty twelve, uh, after I know we're going to go through X Men Evolution for a while, but in twenty twelve, you had a several episode run directing another one of my favorite animated superhero shows, Avengers Earth Mightiest Heroes. Mm -hmm. How had anim? I'm just super curious. How did animation, especially like television animation, did you see it change within that decade uh, between uh, Evolution and Avengers? Um. Well, at that point, the big change as far as uh, being a director from one to the next is the advent of using um um uh, uh animatics i think that was on that film where we this series we were using animatics which was a um way of you, you put the storyboards on film and you shoot them and you cut them together as if you're cutting together real film and stuff you work with an editor back in evolution that wasn't anything anyone had heard of doing except in, if you're in features because it was a, an enormous cost and seemed like a silly waste of time you know, on evolution you would just uh, slug and time your boards, send them off, <laughs> or, or and you'd send them to the you know the network of the producers or whatever. And they'd get a big stack of storyboards, you know, like two a foot to two foot tall or whatever, and it's supposed to go through it. But I'm assuming very few of them did because it, it's very difficult to read page after page of storyboards. Um, so the the whole idea of the uh, animatic was a huge boon for the, the network. And anyone wanting to actually get an idea of what the show was about ahead of time, and as opposed to the other way. So, you know, they could actually give you notes on the show as opposed to just hoping that they catch everything from the script to the storyboard and, and then worry about it when it comes in color. So, what was, was the vibe? big difference? Yeah. What was the vibe like on Avengers versus X Men the Evolution? What the vibe like? What was the atmosphere oh. working for it versus. Well, it's a whole that that was uh, well on um, uh, X Men Evolution. It was a very collaborative thing because the producer Boyd Kirkland, he, you know, he brought in a lot of people he knew and trusted, and, and wanted to work with them creatively. Uh, so you know, a lot of times we'd break stories down and stuff when we'd go to lunch. You know, we'd all go to all the, him and the directors would go to lunch every day and you know, discuss ideas for upcoming stories or. You know what help you know, ask for help for trying to figure this out or that out and whatnot, and it was much more uh, uh, everyone everyone working together. Um, Avengers. By the time I only worked on the second season of Avengers because uh, they 
the crew had turned over at that point. And Frank Parr, who was also one of the directors on uh, Evolution, was now the producer of it, or the supervising director, or whatever his title was on it. And so I, I was hired to help after someone else had dropped out, one of the other directors had dropped out, and I replaced him. And it was different because pretty much the scripts were the scripts at that point. You'd, you'd be able to talk to them a little bit about, gee, can you, I'm going to have trouble doing this, and the story editors or whatever would, you know, try to fix it for you or whatever, or tell you why you should fix, do it that way or, or why it needs to be that way. Um, but it was a lot less collaborative. And, you know, while it was still working with friends and stuff, it was much more of a, uh, a real serious production, whereas Evolution was much more of us just kind of having a good time putting together a show. <laughs> yeah, and I wonder, I mean, the Avengers as a brand, as property, exploded, especially, yeah. you know, when you were on on Earth, Earth Mightiest versus, you know, the X-Men, which at the time, I guess you had the movies, though. I mean, yeah. it was... I, I forget it came out during the same time as the first X Men movie. It came out well, like was, a few months after the movie, I think. Yeah, that they, was why we did the show. That's why the yeah, show yeah. was ordered because of the yeah. movie, and that's why there are a few of the things that were in the movie actually made it into our show. Mainly, uh, Professor Xavier's wheelchair. That was the exact same wheelchair, and uh, the fact that Professor X spoke with uh, a British accent. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you know so, uh, someone. D definitely doing a uh, uh, a take on him, uh, Patrick Stewart, and uh, but pretty that was kind of the intention. Is it was Marvel's way, who was at that time a toy company, Toy Biz. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to find another avenue of toys that they could do that they owned solely on their own. You know, they were doing all the X Men movie toys, yeah, but they so also true. wanted to do a a, a uh, line of them that they owned completely. And so they were paying for this show all on their own and hoping to create a whole uh, new line that was popular. Unfortunately, the timing was bad for them because their main distributor for KB Toys was, um, I mean, for Toy Biz was KB Toys, which had just got pirated out by uh, and destroyed and sold for parts. And so there was KB Toys went under and so Toy Biz no longer had a play, an outlet, really. You know, they, I don't think they were really much in toy, uh, Toys R Us or anything else at that time. And so, unfortunately, they couldn't figure out how to sell toys for our show or any other show at that point. What's, I remember buying a, a Nightcrawler from Evolution yeah. Action Figure at a KB Toys that we would always hit on our way back home at, at sure. the local outlets and being so excited, I was able to get one that saw the whole rest of the line. And the next time I went back, like, KB Toys was gone. Yeah. And so yeah. I was like, I'm stuck. I just have Nightcrawlers. So yeah, this, this no, rings they, very true. Yeah, unfortunately, their line of X-Men Evolution Toys was very short. I mean, there were a couple of Wolverines. There was a Toad. A, a Blob. A, was you had a Storm. Yeah, There's a Blob. A blob. A blob Storm, big, yeah. 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 And the greatest and, character ever, Spike. Was there a Spike? I guess I haven't looked at these in a while, I guess. Yeah. I've got a box of them somewhere in the garage, but... Um, yeah, and, and they did some larger figures like uh, uh, Barbie doll size, twelve inch figures, where they had lockers that they <laughs> they could put, go into their uh, civvies and uniforms and back and forth and stuff, and uh, and they had some motorbike ones, you know, remote control motorbikes where Sabretooth and and um, uh, Wolverine would, you know, you could control them and they'd go zipping around, and they also had. Uh, Talkback toys. I think they only got as far as Cyclops and Wolverine. I remember the Sabretooth. Cyclops one. I yeah. definitely had the Cyclops one. Yeah. Were you heavily involved on the toy end? You know, Not really, no. Designs or anything, or did they send them to you? Because I worked they, at Marvel they, during Wolverine and the X Men, and Toy Biz was still around, and yeah. they were feeding each other designs of the characters and the figures. Yeah, we, we were given some input from the toy company, or mostly it was Marvel, because Marvel was the toy company. Isn't it? They would tell us things like, gee, we really want a Wolverine to have, for his color to be more orange, because that's a better color for toys, or you know something like that. And uh, it was pretty much, you know, we did our thing, and they did their thing, though, and they didn't give us too much hassle. 
um, or you know, back there wasn't a lot of back and forth. You know, the, I I know one of the toy designers who's no longer in that business, but he, you know, he was very excited. And he'd send us stuff occasionally and whatnot. Like I still have a uh, the mock up of the wheelchair somewhere, <laughs> and uh, uh, and they sent us I think like a couple of heads of characters or something just to look at it and stuff. So. But other than that, we were so busy and they were so busy that we never really went, had a lot of uh, back and forth between us. Well, I, I'm sorry to hear that because, well, I'm sorry to hear that the, the, the toy line didn't reach its full potential because I remember when that yeah. line came out, everyone wanted Gene, they wanted a Rogue. It was... Yes, yeah, so and they never got there. Yeah. It, oh, man. <laughs> well, part of it too is back. In those days, I don't know what they think these days, but I know back in those days, they actually thought that this, we can't sell girls yeah. characters to boys because that's the only collector. I don't think they had a clue that girls were a huge fan base for the show. Uh, kids WB, who was running the show, uh, knew it but because they, we were beating Pokemon and they figured out the only way that we could be beating Pokemon is by having girls watching. <laughs> stuff along with the boys it couldn't just be a boys show and beat pokemon it had to be both but i don't think the toy company understood that and so there was very rare that even in the original line of x-men toys there weren't that many uh, uh females involved you know or they were very rare that you'd see it would be done in limited numbers and such because they just didn't get the idea that no the, the people that like x-men really like the women a lot yeah I, so. I, I, a lot of people i mean x-men fans love the female characters so yeah. much and whether you're a boy or a girl i just remember being on the message boards at the time and people really wanting iceman gene rogue you know and, and wanted the line to continue so i'm sorry that it boiled down to a distribution problem especially yeah. with kb toys because that's that's disheartening yeah and unfortunately that all added up to it only having four seasons uh, because, yeah because marvel was paying for it completely on out of their own pocket which is something they never did after that or even before that but after that definitely that was the last show they paid for as they were toy biz you know, afterwards, obviously, when Marvel became Marvel and started doing the the MCU and stuff, that was a whole different thing. But at that point, they they were paying for that out of their pocket, and so they wanted to make it. They were you know, had had a contract with Kids WB to put X amount of ads on the air, which Kids WB loved, and nice. they could never quite get that together. And mainly because they couldn't the whole KB problem, so that they kept begging. I think after season two. They started begging for the uh, Kids WB to let them out of this five-year contract, five-season contract. And Kids WB said, no, you, we'll let you out of not putting the ads on, because, but we've got a hit show. We want to keep this thing going. This is good for us. And so finally on the fifth, before the somewhere in the middle of the fourth season or something, Marvel continued whining and asking to be let out of it. And they finally said, fine, we're, we're, you know, you're giving us a headache. You, know, you, know, <laughs> you we can you can wrap up at the end of season four. Dang, so. that is so interesting. Wow, that <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I need like a moment to digest this. This, is, <laughs> yeah, this, yeah. this explains yeah, I, so much of why my favorite show like went off the air after. Yeah, after I mean, they had a hit show on their hands, and yeah. Marvel didn't care. Mm -hmm. They just wanted to stop having to put that money out so i did i didn't know that marvel fully funded x-men evolution and they were banking on toy sales i mean now in retrospect you're like yeah you're like wow that really didn't pan out the way they thought it was going to pan out but you yeah, ended up having it was a, a bad idea yeah but there, there may have been some other investors but they were yeah. it was basically marvel money and that's why it was all um, is that is way, that so. Is that why season four was shorter than the other season? I, I assume it was. I assume that at that point, that's, you know, some of the storylines got a little truncated and whatnot. And, uh, but I, the, the good news is that we knew early enough going into season four or by the middle of the season four that they could actually write up 
basically a capper, you know, some way to put a button on it all and say, this is, we know the show's over. And instead of just leaving it on a cliffhanger like we did Wolverine and the X-Men, you know, just. Oh, you know, that that is a conversation for another day because we yeah. were covering Age of Apocalypse here on 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 the podcast and that ending for X-Men Evo- uh, Wolverine and the X-Men just got me so excited cuz Nate Gray is my favorite character. Sure. And and then you guys also had other stories planned like with Wanda and House of M so Yeah, sure. I mean we, that was intended to go on but that not it wasn't due to Marvel in that case it was due to them not paying for any of it, Marvel, at that point. But they had outside investors who couldn't get along and decide who wanted to put the majority money in or whatever. And Because I, I assume it's been, it's been a while, but I think it had a lot to do with the fact that they couldn't figure out how to turn a profit either, the investors, on it. It was just, it was a hit show, but that, that didn't do anything for them. It did something for the network. But, hmm. you know, unless the way – it would have helped them as if they had other shows that they wanted to sell to the networks and stuff and by using Wolverine and the X-Men as a calling card kind of thing. But they could not agree on who would put the 60% in and who would put the 40% in. They, you know, neither of them wanted to be putting more than the other and you know, whatever. So, so it fell apart and we, we started early development on that and it just never went anywhere. Oh so. man, that just, did, we we've seen some of those sketches leave for for Wolverine and the X Men and what you guys had planned with Jean in her traditional '90s outfit and bring in Havoc. It looked great. I'm sorry the the second season never came into fruition. Yeah, no, I was too. <laughs> it was <laughs> it was a good show to work on. What so. can, can I just ask off script here? Was Nate Gray ever in the talks? X Man ever in the talks? Did you guys get that far? I, you know, I don't think so. I don't think he was going to. I hadn't heard of him being brought in at that point yeah. but uh you know we were, we were doing deadpool we were doing um yeah god there were a lot of others that i can't think of right now I, i've got a file yeah i think you had magic a... havoc yeah i'm trying to remember we've all seen the the sketches online but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes but yeah um, i i don't recall it i don't know if he was in it or not but yeah it, it may at that point it was basically just me and boyd the producer he was uh doing uh, expressions and attitude sheets, and I was doing some expressions and attitude sheets, but I didn't really know what he was working on, and he would assign me these characters, and he'd take the other characters himself. So I, he may have had Nick Cray. I really don't know. Oh. So. Sorry, I'm going to I'm going to kick it back to Cody. I'm sorry, I had no, to ask about Nate. <laughs> I had to ask about Nate. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, I guess since we're on since we're on different X Men and since we're on different characters, uh, Stephen, when did you first hear about the X Men? Well, I, back when I was a kid, little kid, I, I we'd all go to the, uh, not the comic store, there were no comic stores, but I'd go, we'd go to the newsstand and pick up comics, you know, once or twice a week or whatever with my father. And we would, um, you know, I, I picked up X-Men. So back in the early days, I, you know, I had the first few X-Men, you know, with Stanley and Jack Kirby doing them and stuff. So that, I knew them from then. And to be honest, I didn't know much. I, I kind of stopped at a certain point way before uh, any of the Claremont stuff started or anything like that. You know, I, And I kind of vaguely knew about it a little bit because my kids were picking up X-Men at that point. So, But you know, to me, I thought Beast, Wolverine and Beast were the same character because I, I was just <laughs> casually looking at it and I said, yeah. wow, look at the hair. It must be the same character. It's just blue <laughs> this time you know, or whatever. You know. I had no idea. I did not stay up on them at all. And I had to take a deep dive when um, I got hired by Boyd to work on X-Men Evolution. So I kind of learned all, everything I could as fast as I could. Were, so, were you able to? Yeah, like what was your what was your yeah. X-Men diet like after you got hired on? Uh, it was pretty heavy. Um, you know, <laughs> at that point, Children of the Atom had just started coming out too, which helped a little bit. So I, I could read some of those and look at them as opposed to... Uh, you know, reading something, you, you go back and you look at the original X-Men. And it's, I mean, I, I loved them as a kid, but boy, there's some real awful stuff in them. <laughs> the real sexism and just, just awful, awful stuff. 
I mean, yeah. they call they call Gina frail. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it, Professor X is clearly lusting after her or something. Oh, yeah. we have discussed that many <laughs> times. Yeah. It's 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 oh. But wait, so you're doing the deep dive. You're you're on evolution. Yeah. You're doing the deep dive. You're trying to amass as much information about the X Men yeah. as possible. Was there a particular character that was your favorite that kind of stood out as you're doing this deep dive into into the characters? Um, well, I, I thought I. I I thought Nightcrawler had a lot of potential, and I kind of saw him as something that I could put my, my stamp on, as far as not just costuming wise, but the way he moved and stuff. I mean, I, I didn't care for the weird, you know, um, three-fingered weird foot that he had. <laughs> you know, with the one in the back, the heel turned into a finger, and the two others. So, so I. I uh, turned him into more like a cat, you know, more like a, you know, typical um, feline type character that could, that had a, an animal anatomy that was normal for an animal, not a human, obviously. Uh, so there was that. And, um, and I, I was kind of interested quite a bit in Rogue because I, you know, I was somewhat aware of the show. I, I maybe had seen maybe one episode or two episodes of the uh, 90s show. And I couldn't stand the the whole Dolly Parton Southern Belle approach to that character. You know, it just seemed like, boy, is this just like some fanboy's fantasy of a superhero? <laughs> you know, humongous breasts and big poofy hair, and you know, some fanboy that had never gotten out of the you know, basement. You know, I thought, Ugh. so you know, so she was kind of the one that I focused on initially. Thought if I could crack her. And turn her into something else, then I think the rest of the show would follow, and it did. It turns out, you know, once I kind of got her down and figured out that she could be goth, and you know, you know and, and obviously this is with the producers' help, Boyd's yeah. help and stuff, and you know, the other people too, the other directors. You know, Frank Parr was one of the other directors who, who was the supervising director on uh, Avengers second season. You know, he did some of the early costuming because I couldn't wrap my head around quite all that. I was not a, a superhero costume guy. You know, I kept thinking, geez, shorts, that's so weird. And, you know, all that stuff. Um, so he kind of cracked to some of those early costumes. But then I was the one who kind of figured out who they were as people and stuff, you know, who, you know, especially Rogue, you know, figuring out that, you know, she's not a Southern Belle by any stretch. She's, you know, trailer trash. And you know she she's got a southern accent, but it's not a refined southern accent whatsoever. It's it's something that you know southerners would laugh at as being really uh like the difference between a British accent and a uh, um uh, uh, yeah, Cockney accent. Cockney accent. Thank yeah. You. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That type of thing. So so once we kind of got that in, I, I was able to kind of work around the others. I, I, I wish I'd had more time, because, but to kind of play with some of the others that I didn't quite get nailed down sufficiently, like Mystique and even Storm, I think, was rushed. Because it was just a certain point you have to kind of go with it because there wasn't enough. We didn't know enough about what they were going to be used for in the show. Hmm. We wrote, we knew what her function was going to be throughout the show, so um, you know, she was easier to deal with. You know, when you're doing character designs, or at least when I'm doing character designs, I like to have as much information about how the characters, their personality, how they're going to be used in the show and stuff. And that way, it helps me refine them so to what they need to be. So they're not just a design; they're a fully, you know, birth personality. Well, so, so. even when when you so. say used in the show, how much of the the early storylines or trajectory of where X-Men Evolution was going to go. What did, the, what did that look like when you started designing? How much of that was still amorphous or how much was set in stone already? Well, we, we'd had a lot of discussions going in early on. There was a Bible that was kind of hit and miss for a lot of people that was created. Um, I mean, it had so, some of the initial setup in it, like who, who the characters could be and not personality wise necessarily, but there may have been some of that too. But I don't think we looked at the Bible much as a group. I mean, I think Boyd and the uh, his executive producer, 
looked at it and probably the story editor and stuff, but I don't think we ever sat down and went through it on our own. Um, but, you know, this long time ago, over 20 years ago, yeah, I yeah, yeah. maybe misremembered. <laughs> but but we understood and we kind of talked through the idea that, well, she's going to start off as a bad guy and they have to try to turn her and, you know, things like that. And, and some of that what might have been in the Bible is still unknown as to how we were going to handle the character personality-wise and stuff. And, and and that was important. And I think some of that was... Uh, handled once we kind of figured out who she was once we knew she was goth and once we knew that she was trailer trash and stuff we knew that how we wanted her to behave and stuff i mean if we'd had even more time i think we would have gone even deeper into that uh unfortunately development time was very limited i think we had a couple of months to develop a lot of the characters before we actually had to start producing episodes and stuff really wow wait so how did you get involved with X-Men Evolution? And do I remember correctly that when we saw you at WonderCon, you said that originally the concept for it was more like a Muppet Baby style X-Men? Well, I, I don't th- I don't know that that was the the actual plan to mm-hmm. do that, but that's how we everyone assumed it would be. We knew it was going to be <laughs> young, you made younger. And at that point, one of the big hit shows was Muppet Babies. Mm-hmm. around that time so they were doing a lot of that type of stuff with a lot of shows suddenly they were baby this baby that and so we thought oh god is this going to turn into that and <laughs> stuff i don't know that it was ever seriously planned that way but that's kind of how it was discussed amongst ourselves as artists and stuff but oh boy we've got x-men babies coming here or something you know? <laughs> so I'm just curious um, if you have a drawer yeah. full of X-Men Muppet Baby style. No, I do, do not. I do not have that. <laughs> that might have been fun on a diff- whole different level, but that was yeah. it. <laughs> but we always saw this as sort of a uh, uh, soap opera. We, we we were not, the people involved were not um, big into action you know, and fighting and constant fighting and stuff and all that. We, we, we fought against that concept of of having a big action sequence in moment in every act you know that that's pretty typical for that type of show we we avoided that like crazy we wanted to have it more about the characters and stuff so that's kind of where we went with it as much as we could so I, you know a lot of times that that would uh, be forced into the storytelling after the fact after some of the scripts were written and you'd have to go back and kind of rework it. it's like no we don't want to have these characters fight just because one's a good guy and one's a bad guy. We want to understand why they're fighting and stuff. And, and if they're going to, why do they need to fight if there's, there's no reason to be. So, so, so you're doing, you did the deep dive. You, there were murmurs of how the show could be, but how were you approached on, on, on joining the project? Well, at that point I was working at the same uh, studio as a uh, boy. I, I've known Boyd for years. I mean, he had um, worked, he owned a company in Utah that was doing um, layouts and stuff for uh, shows for like the um, uh, Ruby Spears and Hanna Barbera and stuff like that. And a company I was, a studio I was working for had hired his company to do layouts for some direct videos that we were doing. And then, uh, and I'm not sure what why he decided to but he left his own company and gave it to other people to run and decided he wanted to ca- come to california and get into it more of the uh, animation aspect and less of the layout aspect you know, he, he was a layout artist and you know which you know does all the backgrounds and stuff like that and kind of places the characters essentially for the animator um but he wanted to get into storyboarding and he wanted to get into acting. So he came actually working for us at that studio and, and I kind of helped him get into understanding how to make a character act and stuff. I gave him my knowledge. And then so we uh, kind of kept in touch here and there. He, he worked in, on a, um, I'm not sure what he was working on at that, at Saban. We, we kind of hooked back up at Saban after well yeah i did work for him on batman and stuff like that too but at saban he uh was working on something and i got hired to direct on another show and while we were there i think he was offered to take over 
some Avengers show they were doing at the time. They asked him to go ahead and revamp it and do whatever he needed to. I know some Avengers show that was not very canon or anything else. Yeah, Avengers well, United was, They Stand, I believe what it was called. Yeah, yeah. something like that. Yeah. And so he, he was wanting to get me on it and was doing character designs and stuff. So we started doing that. And then I think he got the offer to work on F- X-Men Evolution as a producer. And he wanted me on it, as well as some other people he worked with and stuff. And so I joined it, joined on that uh, during the X-Men Evolution as a director, I was hired initially. And then because we didn't know what we were doing at that moment, development-wise, we a, a <laughs> lot of us just kind of pitched in and started doing development. Like I said, Frank did some of the initial ideas for yeah. costuming and stuff, and I kind of was working on the characters. And eventually, I think it came down to that, I, I took a lot of Frank's concepts costume wise and kind of put them on my characters and it started to come together. Um, and Boyd just decided, okay, you're the character designer on this as what well, was the director. And uh, that's pretty much how it went. I mean, it was by, it, like everything in this business, it's who you know. And, you know, for networking and friends and all that stuff, you know, you get your next job through them and stuff. So, so, it's in this early stages of development. You've been brought in. Different people are are pitching different things. What was what was the communication? I'm curious between the the studios who have just had this X Men live action movie, and then Marvel Comics that's starting to do a pretty big like rebrand and relaunch of the X Men under like Grant Morrison, big popular new X Men run. And you guys are in the middle. What what was the communication like? Was there was there a push and pull? I know you mentioned like Xavier needing the the Patrick Stewart inspired accent. Yeah. What what other pushes and pulls were between those? Very two very courses? little. They pretty much left us alone to do what we wanted, which so is pretty yeah. weird. I mean, that is uh, weird. You know, it, it, they they would kind of look at what we were doing design wise and kibitz a little, but they didn't care all that much. They're, they're, occasionally, when we had an issue, they would say, "Well, why don't you try this?" Like with Sabretooth, we were having trouble coming up with something because of that. You know, the traditional Sabretooth was in that bizarre yeah. costume with all I the fur around it. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so, you know, we, we were having trouble coming up with anything. So they said, you know, why don't you try them in an overcoat? Why? Well, uh, we're putting them in an overcoat. Like, Can you show uh-huh. us? No, we won't show uh-huh. you, but just try to put them in an overcoat. So. Uh-huh. So that we were getting stuff like that. I mean, like I said, the most input they gave us was that they said, here, why don't you use Professor X's chair, the same one we're using, which was great because that, we didn't have to design that. And uh, the Patrick Stewart thing, We, but at that point, everyone knew Patrick Stewart was Professor yes. X. He yeah. was all over the news and stuff. And the only thing that they gave us input other than, originally we wanted to put all the characters in the traditional Kirby yellow and black jumpsuits. Oh Even yeah. If there was some variation on them, we still wanted those to be their main colors. And they said, no, we have to have them with their own, own traditional colors or what we know is a new traditional colors. Now, you know, Jean had to have green. Um, Kitty had to have blue. Uh, you know, that type of thing. You know, there, there were others like that too. So that they gave input in that. And I think that was more of a toy decision, too, as far as that goes, because it's harder to sell toys that all look like they're wearing the same costume than it is having <laughs> different costumes. Yeah. And then uh, we uh, also, they said, we, we said, you know, we're getting, you know, these mutton chops look stupid on Wolverine. And they said, okay, we don't care. Said, but, but could you please give them that weird, some sort of weird points? Something. So I came up with something that looked like a normal hairstyle, not something that looked like it had spent hours hairspraying, like <laughs> even in the movies and stuff. So, yeah, that's pretty more much it. There. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just, it's like, come on, no one's hair really looks that way. It looks okay, sort of, in the comic, but it, it doesn't make any sense. But, but to piggyback off of what Cody was asking, it's interesting because Wolverine later on in Morrison's. X Men would have a haircut similar towards the one he was having in Evolution at the time, and I believe it was Frank Quitely who illustrated it. So, 
I think the idea yeah, was I, your approach too, which is what is a realistic hairstyle for someone like Logan? Yeah, I, I think I, you know, I don't know that I ever saw that. If I saw that first, I don't think so. But I think I think there's a lot of you know cross pollination, unintentional. Or, oh yeah, absolutely. But not um, mandated or anything like that. I think it was just you know, people that were starting to think the same way or they saw something they liked in us and they and we saw something, you know, when I was doing Wolverine's costume, I, I kind of looked at a lot of stuff and finally came up with ours. And it, I don't know that, I, I know there's a similar costume that came out after that for, uh, that looked like Wolverine, but I don't, I don't know that they copied me or I copied them or anything. I don't remember. It was, no, it was a long time ago. No, it's all cross pollination, uh, yeah. as you were yeah. saying. It, I, I am curious though, with every, you know, with all the communication that was or was not happening, did did Mister Stan Lee ever weigh in on the series? No, he, he he was. I mean, I know he was given some sort of executive producer credit, but at that point, he was not involved whatsoever. He was busy doing his own thing and whatnot. Now, I worked with him years later, but he was not really at all involved with. X Men Evolution or any of those properties at the time. I mean, he was just being given this, you know, the credit, uh, honorary mention credit, basically that yeah. he got because he was being paid and whatnot. So, did he? Now, Avi Arad was much more involved than he was, and he was kind of barely involved. So. Oh, Avi, yeah. But wait, did Stanley ever acknowledge that you you did X Men Evolution when you worked with him? I was like, hey, that was a great interesting interpretation you know, I, I don't know i you know i i don't know if ever, if it ever came up yeah. now that i'm thinking about it you know we had plenty of conversations and stuff but usually it was about the project we were working on yeah um well i don't know good you know, question i i wish I'd, i i wish i had mentioned it to him but i'd be willing to bet he probably never saw it yeah <laughs> I, mean, I, I yeah i don't think unless he was directly brought in for a cameo or something like that. He was ever that uh, intrinsically involved or, or even that all that interested. I mean, you can hear that in some of his uh, interviews and stuff where people are asking him questions about even the movies and stuff. And it's clear he's just kind of riffing and he doesn't, he, he, you know, he's very good at making it sound like he sort of knows what's, what's going on, but he, if you listen to it, you go, I don't think he saw that, did he? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. We had Margaret Lesh on the on the podcast a couple of months ago, and she was talking about Stan. And she said Stan just really did trust the people around him to make some of those decisions because yeah. we were talking about the X-Men, the animated series. And hmm. she said that he was he delegated quite a bit yeah. and that he oh, I was doubt it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't doubt that for a minute. I mean, he was very, uh, I mean, that, that's sort of how he worked in the comics, too. If you, yeah. if you read anything about how he worked, he basically, uh, you would spit ball ideas and then he'd let the artist go run off with it or the other writers and stuff. And, and maybe he'd come in and, you know, do dialogue and whatnot. But it, he wasn't a really hands on type of guy. He was more of a, uh, uh, let's make a deal. <laughs> let's get something going and then you know <laughs> uh, you know he, he was much better at that pr the promotional idea of it and stuff he you know that was his forte you know sitting down and actually doing the day-to-day -day work of writing something or i mean he did some of that but early on but i, I think he should, soon found that that was kind of a drag and <laughs> he's much better at something else so so i think delegating was clearly his way of working throughout his career so I don't think he really I doubt he even knew that X-Men Evolution was being made. <laughs> <That's the truth. laughs> you know, at that point he was just kind of one of the names that was being thrown on the credits and it, it really uh, uh, unless he found out something was being made and he wasn't getting his cut of it or something then you know that was another issue but he, he had a whole different deal going on that didn't matter if we made five series or one so or none. It's so interesting. This is awesome. Um, okay, so a, a lot of different designs, a lot of different voices. Um, is there, I have two parts for this. One, what was your 
personal favorite design? I know you said Rogue. Besides Rogue, what was your personal favorite of the, the character costume designs? And is there a character that you wanted to include and you, you were a big advocate for after you're your diving deep into X-Men lore when you're getting ready for the yeah. show that you guys never got to include? Well, uh, the, the three characters that I liked the best as far as um, having designed were, were Rogue because it was kind of groundbreaking as far as and show cracking. You know, we figured out the rest of the show from her and um, and Wanda. You know, that, that was a big deal. Wanda was um, awesome as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and th th that was completely something we came up with all on our own, that whole idea that she was damaged beyond belief and that she was much more contemporary rich, witchy than this fantasy you know, which, you know, um, that she was in the comics where it was just like, well, you're, you're a uh, stripper witch, I guess, or something in the comics. <laughs> yeah. But um, she went through many iterations in the yes, comics. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and then Boom Boom, I think, was a, a big oh. one because that, she was a real interesting so character because there was not a lot of done with her, but we all kind of thought, boy, she had a tremendous amount of. Um, possibilities and potential. Um, in fact, we were going to include her into the first season, and we we kind of did it. Thought we were kind of planting her as a background character, and we ended up not ever calling her anything, Tabby or anything, other than to ourselves. And then by the time we actually, I think in season two, created Boom Boom. The, you know, the stories for Boom Boom. It's like, uh, we discarded that design because we didn't think it was strong enough. And we kind of put a new design for her and stuff. So so if you look, the, the, she's actually in a different character. She's got weird pigtails or something. Or, you know, <laughs> um, I think she's in like the camp out episode or something, or when they're all going away on a field trip or something that you can see her in the background, but she never went anywhere at that point. But I, I she, have, she had a tremendous amount of storytelling that we could do with her, I think. She had swagger when she was finally introduced. I mean, that's a character that also gets so much recognition from X-Men Evolution. And she doesn't have that TLC anywhere else, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, she'll pop up here and there in the comics and, you know, be a fun solo series. But you guys really did a great job putting her front and center. And fans loved her in the yeah. series. Yeah. I think she had a much more interesting, relatable storyline than I think a lot of uh, the other characters did. I mean, the other characters all had wildly superhero storylines and stuff and how they got their powers and stuff. Where she, you know, coming from an abusive father and, you know, someone manipulating her. And, and clearly she was more uh, fluid than other the other characters and whatnot. And, you know, I, I think she had... And I'm still surprised that no one's done more with her at this point in comics and stuff. Or maybe they haven't. I haven't seen it. I know um, they used her in uh, New Wave. Oh, I did. To, for comedic effect. <clears throat> oh, my God. Agents of Hate, the, the yeah. next wave. She Next wave, that's it, yes. Is yeah. hysterical in yeah. that comic. It's a, the, And they, they sort of transplanted that personality into some of the Krakoan X-Men that are yeah. happening right now. And especially, did you read Exterminators? I just, Cody? I just oh, finished yeah, reading did. Exterminators this past week and Boom Boom is one of like the main, the core five. And it's funny because it's it's her and it's it's Laura Kinney and it's it's a few others. And it's it's very much, it's it reminded me a lot, honestly, of, and I know we have some questions about it coming up, kind of the the, the Girls' Night Out episodes of Evolution. But if it was like a whole, a whole five issue series and Boom Boom is super prominent, but I have to check that out. What's it, 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 was, it was it was exterminators. exterminators. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But wait, Cody, you, know, you know why? Because we've had Leah Williams on this podcast before, and she she grew up, she's a big X Men Evolution fan. That's the writer for Exterminators, and her crush growing up was Goth Rogue, and she <laughs> loved she loved Boom Boom, and she loved x23 slash wolverine slash laura so i'm just piecing it together of course Matt. exterminators would be heavily influenced by x-men evolution because she That's grew up loving that yeah you got to pick it you up you should check it out it's it, it feels very much like a love letter to the Is she the writer of, of it, evolution yeah, yeah leah williams oh, okay. yeah oh, okay i'll have to definitely check that out yeah, yeah I'll i'm send you glad someone's doing something with it yeah. oh okay <laughs> thank you 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm glad someone did something with it. Uh, yeah, uh, we were always. I know there was a X Men Evolution comic, but tell you the truth, we we had at one point tried to convince them to let us let us do it. You know, that way it'd be something we could do in between seasons or something like that. But they they had to rush and get it done by other people, and so we had no idea what they were doing with it. And we don't know if it worked counter to our stuff or with it or <laughs> anything else. And it, it always kind of worried us a little bit that they'd explore areas that we hadn't and didn't want to and stuff. So, but I am glad that someone is kind of riffing on the X Men Evolution thing a little bit. So. Well, it always seemed like there, there was definitely potential there. I, yeah. I, I feel everyone, the, the X-Men evolution is still such a major part of the X-Men conversation. And this leads into my next question. It's funny. We were, I was talking to another podcaster who does Buffy Slayer Fest 98. Mm-hmm. And it, it, is, is it true that Charisma Carpenter was the inspiration for, for Gene, your designs for Gene and Chris Klein was, was Cyclops? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we, <laughs> I mean, we were. Yeah. I mean, Chris Klein obviously wasn't a Buffy person, but uh, no. uh, but we we were definitely fans of Buffy. And Boyd Kirkland, the producer, was a huge fan of Buffy. He got me into it and stuff, and Angel and so forth. Um, and I don't even know if he knew at that point that uh, Buffy was sort of Joss's way of riffing on Kitty or not, yeah. but. I mean, definitely, he he recognized the potential. Of, I'm doing a high school show. I want to do it like Buffy. I wanted to have the same residence and stuff, and kind of do a lot of the uh, winking at the camera stuff with stuff. And that's why we dropped a lot of uh, references visually. Oh, the dance, it. the, yeah. the Faith Buffy dance, which gets yeah. homaged all the time yeah. <laughs> online because, yeah. and and people loved that. Did did they know that at the time? I feel like that's something that definitely came in after the show that people were aware of it but at the time were people saying we got that reference uh you know i don't know if they did it, it, because you yeah, realize the the internet was a lot different place then yeah uh you know facebook wasn't around and i we, there were a lot of things that were happening that we did not know were happening and plus you know being busy and professionals and stuff in the industry we didn't spend a lot of time on facebook even though now we all do and <laughs> stuff get out <laughs> there while we're working and stuff but um we had no idea what people were reacting to necessarily. I mean, we were more concerned with what network numbers we were getting and stuff. Um, but yeah, you know, I don't think we knew much about people's actual reactions to it. We knew that the Lance and Kitty thing was sort of big. I don't know yeah. how we heard that. I think one of the, one of the production managers that came onto the show uh, told us some of that. And uh, we, we knew that... Um, we knew that crawler was kind of popular and stuff, but you know, frankly, we didn't know how popular Kitty was. I, you know, until I started going to conventions and getting uh, commission requests or Kitty after Kitty, I had no <laughs> idea how big a deal she was. <laughs> we, so, you know, we didn't. You know, she wasn't really that big a star of the show. She was kind of big, but you know, the the biggest thing we did with her was the Lancity thing and the uh, uh, the girls' night out thing. Um, but you know, we kind of saw her sort of a secondary character in a lot of ways. But you know, apparently the viewers sure didn't. They saw her as a big thing. No, she was. I so think one of my she's yeah. one of my favorites too. And I think definitely, like as as one of the younger viewers at the time, like you know, it's it's the classic audience surrogate. I think what's funny is she got to serve kind of the same role that she does when she's introduced to the X Men comics as yeah. well as like she was the younger entry point character that got to look up to to scott and gene just like i feel like we got to as a younger audience so kitty kitty was awesome she yeah, was, she was okay. yeah I, I think she worked great yeah in, in, in general but the, the amount of love for her was just astounding i mean i mean <laughs> uh, on another note the fact that we didn't know stuff you know one time we went to um what was it i think at that point it was wolverine and the x-men we went to we were at comic-con and Boyd and I were led into the audience. They, we weren't on the panel, and I don't remember why. Maybe it wasn't Wolverine in the Asian. Maybe it was something else. Uh, we, we were just in the audience, and people came up to us 
And Boyd freaked out. He didn't know what was going on. He didn't. Re- I think I, I at that point had a little understanding of some of the popularity of X Men Evolution, but he didn't know that anyone would recognize us. He, anyway, so that was very staggering at that point to realize that not only did were they fans of the show, but they were fans of us, and they would recognize us at the comic convention and stuff. So it's very strange. Is go for it, Paul. I just wanted to ask a quick question because when we we've had the Leewalds on, you know, in the past and they were prohibited from using Kitty because of pride of the X-Men. And I'm curious, did you get it doesn't sound like you got any pushback with with Kitty. Did did they say you needed to include Jubilee given Jubilee's popularity just a few years prior? No, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I you know, some of that was behind the scenes stuff that was above my pay grade, I guess. But Mm -hmm. I had not heard any of that type of stuff whatsoever. I mean, it seemed like anything we wanted to do, they were fine with. In general, I mean, I'm sure there are some things that we had to deal with, obviously, on any TV show. But overall, it seemed like every idea we came up with, they were perfectly fine with. Marvel wasn't that interested, and Kids WB was happy that we were doing doing great work in the ratings and. Um, and you, like I said, we came up with that whole wander is damaged and stuff. And that, you know, that, and I don't know how many people caught that or not, but we, we came up with that idea after Buffy did the whole, you know, she's in an insane asylum dreaming all this stuff. And we thought, who can we do that with? And we came up with, let, let's put, wander would be great to put in a straitjacket. Wow. Just, I- you know, I mean, that's an iconic Buffy episode. Um, I'm forgetting yeah. the title right now. But yes, where she's in, in, in the insane yeah. asylum and it sort of ends on that cliffhanger. Maybe she really is there yeah, and imagining right. everything. I didn't know that was the inspiration for the Wanda. Ep- oh, man. Yeah. I mean, it, obviously not nearly the same thing, but it was no, no, sort no. of that image that we got stuck with and thought, wow, we have to do something like that. That was so wonderful that we, we need to somehow find a way to put that in there. And that that was the kind of the genesis for the whole Wanda idea. But before I kick it back to Cody, one final Buffy question: because <laughs> season six of Buffy was kind of you know a, an inspo when, with that, was there ever a talk of a musical for X Men Evolution? You know, I, I I think the closest we got to it was that Walk on the Wild Side thing, or the uh, yeah, or the Bayville <laughs> Sirens, whatever. Uh, you know. <laughs> I don't know that we that would have been a very difficult thing to pull off because all the moving parts, you know, it's one thing in a TV show where if you can if you got the clout to say okay, I'm going to help you know have someone write these songs and then I'm going to get the actors actually to perform them, but to try to do it in a TV series is a lot harder thing. A lot too many different things. You got to get the composer. You got to get yeah. yeah on board and make sure all those songs get approved and you got to make sure that everyone can actually sing and, <laughs> and, and, and you, you know, it, it, it would have been, a, and then on top of it, you know, you have to somehow create visuals that work with it. And, and you know, it, it just, it would have been a, a great idea to do. And maybe if we'd continued, who knows, you know, maybe we would have gotten that, you know, big enough balls to do that type of thing. But, <laughs> I mean, you know, obviously, uh, Joss Whedon had to uh, wait until he had the clout to say, I'm doing this. This is what I'm doing. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it. Like and... it yeah. Uh, but I don't know that we were in that type of position. <laughs> at, at <laughs> I mean, we, we were just grateful we got away with what we could get away with. You know, like, you know, you know, doing things like um, saying that, well, the Super Soldier was actually po- – program was actually the forerunner for the Weapon X program and, you know, kind of mushing things together that – we thought made sense that the comics hadn't put together at that point and stuff, you know, things like that, that we thought, God, there, no one's stopping us from saying this. Okay, let's keep going. So, so to, one, that's super crazy. Cause it's like, cause now what you just mentioned about the super soldier leading to the weapon X and all that, that that's become a, a through line like yeah. since you guys, but it's like, for me that that's been my, my own head cannon for a long time. And I'm realizing now it's, it's because evolution did that first. And then I've read things that came after that. Uh, like I know Morrison's X-Men run, but after yeah. you guys already gone, they, they start to retcon it back to that. And even in the ultimate comics universe, they start to tie, tie in all those together, but you guys, you guys did yeah, that. I, you know, I'm pretty sure that 
to my knowledge, we came up with that while we were sitting at, at a sushi bar. But a, I could be. <laughs> no, I love. I, yeah. So it sounds like you guys, did you guys talk a lot as artists, directors, writers, just about what you were watching and what you were reading? Was that a common part of yeah, the Yeah, there was a lot of that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, the, these uh, lunches were very free wheeling and stuff, and we would kind of bring up all types of stuff that we going on and whatnot, and then someone would be like, yeah, did you see Buffy? Blah, blah, you know, and, you know, yeah. and then you know, we'd kind of riff on that, and then, you know, Boyd would take the ideas to the uh, story editor and stuff, and he'd riff on it, obviously, and stuff, and turn into further things and you know like you know the uh you know, we, we just pull from everything that we could think of that worked and made sense you know like the whole idea of uh wanda you know cutting her hair the way she did i mean it didn't quite work because the animation wasn't there but the whole idea was that you know she was going to cut her hair viciously like <laughs> i think there was some uh movie uh the river runs through it where some character does that mm -hmm. and yeah you, it was clear she's nuts at this point. That's why she's <laughs> doing it. You know, I mean, that's like a some symbol for women over the deep edge. You know, start hacking at their hair and stuff. And you know, and so we wanted to include that type of thing. So there were all types of things we were pulling from. So are there so, any are there any pop cultural homages or references that you you're surprised that the fans haven't caught on to yet? Like even even a few decades later, like well, some are yeah yeah yeah. I mean, there there, there was those. Um, God, what was it now? The uh, thing I mentioned earlier. The uh, uh, now I'm blanking. <laughs> uh, but you know, there, there, there are all types of things. You know, for instance, um, it, it wasn't so much pop culture stuff, but like I had in my head that Kurt was gay because he. I kind of based him a little bit on my son, my middle son, mm -hmm. and I. Oh, and I think the other directors and producers kind of understood that too that's why when we uh hooked him up with amanda we all you know the inside joke was amanda <laughs> so, so, yeah. you know, but I mean, we, we were doing a lot of that and sometimes it was small sometimes it was bigger like the buffy references and stuff um and the you know the, the, that whole uh episode i mean that was kind of based on a whole idea of um i think wasn't there a buffy episode where the the Women kind of did something like that, similar to it, I think. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong. I can't. I'm trying to remember if they had a, yeah, I mean, Buffy, they had like, uh, I think Slayer Fest, where it was just Cordelia and Buffy on their yeah. own misadventures and stuff yeah, maybe like that. Because that. That, I know Boyd was so deep into that. that Yeah. You know, and you had the and, craft, the craft, which yeah, is the craft. The oh, yeah. I mean, well, yeah. well, that, I mean, the whole idea, I mean, Wanda was um, a oh, few years of bulk. Yeah. yeah. 100 mm -hmm. i'm just putting it together now my mind is blown because i've never seen those yeah. parallels with with wanda and and her yeah, yeah oh no it, there was no uh hiding that fact i mean all the um uh expression sheets and everything else i i pulled from feruza bulk and used her and you know that was like this is our wanda and, you know so awesome. perfect and, you know and a lot of it had to do with the craft obviously so well, I, I love all these references that you, that you had there, the, the inspirations in pop culture, some through lines with characters like Kurt, who was probably secretly LGBT. It, I think that's why the show still resonates with a lot of people, because you were speaking up to your audience. You were layering these characters. There was a lot of thought behind it. Are, are there any little like nuggets and stuff like that that you had envisioned for some characters, maybe like Scott or Gene, that you just never got to flesh out in the in the story? Right. Well, it's been a long time. But, I mean, so we're asking you all the tough questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I know. Uh, I mean, it, you know, occasionally we'd come up with ideas that just didn't. Uh, well, that didn't fit in with the other things and stuff. Um, and also, to be fair, I I was only involved in season three and four as the character designer. I was mm -hmm. working at DreamWorks at the time in story and stuff. So my involvement in some of the story discussions at that point were no longer. I was no longer involved. Uh, so they may have been having other story discussions that I wasn't privy to i'd only hear kind of the fallout and say okay well we need these characters and we need you know you know, you have to design this character and this is who that character is and stuff so i was a little less involved in seasons three and four than i would have loved to have been but so th there may have been other things on the you know, deck that were 
discounted or something. I think pretty much everything we wanted to do in seasons one and two, we did do. Hmm. Um, and, you know, there are, it obviously come season two, we kind of felt more sure of ourselves. You know, season one was a lot more scattershot. We were still kind of working off of earlier ideas that we were kind of trying to get away from. And, you know, if you watch the first few episodes, it's definitely very stilted in a lot of ways, very much bing, 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 you know, he meets an X-Men, he, you know, he joins the group, you know. Um, and it was, whereas come season two, things were, and even towards the end of season one, things were starting to layer in better. I mean, we, oh, we realized that accidentally Lance and Kitty liked each other, even though that wasn't written as as part of it. Uh, and that sometimes that happens in storytelling and animations. Like these characters are doing something we didn't uh, didn't expect or plan. You know, they're, they're like they like each other, and so we kind of went with that. Um, and there, there are other things like that that we did throughout. Um, you know, like the whole Rogan Scott thing. I, I think we'd start to see oh, some of the episodes and go, she likes him. <laughs> that's why what what we don't understand why that's happening so that's why boyd wrote the christmas episode yeah yeah you know, you know to really kind of hammer that down because he liked that whole idea and it kind of came out of the blue but he, he wanted to make it part of our canon that you know okay no this is a thing it was she's definitely feeling upset that she can't have scott so and then scott's completely oblivious to the whole thing of course. yeah, yeah. <laughs> He wouldn't be a Summers if he was. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, so speaking of of the show and, and the things it did, there's one character from the series that translated into the comics who's having her 20th year anniversary this year, but fans adore, and that is X-23, Laura, Wolverine. I mean, did you have any idea the character was going to have this level of popularity? No, and, and to be quite honest, we we didn't get it. You know, <laughs> it was, at that point, um, Craig Kyle was the uh, was the uh, showrunner, the the person in charge, the executive producer, or whatever, mm-hmm. and he came up with this character based, I believe, on his fiance's niece, mm-hmm. uh, and wanted to incorporate her in there. You know, he, he obviously had knew what he was doing. Because you know he, he created this whole another parallel line of X Men storytelling that became, like you said, so popular and huge. And it, it's just you know when, when I was first given the, the assignment to design it, like I said, I wasn't on at that point as far as story discussions or anything. I was just said, okay, here's this character. This is who she is. In fact, Craig even took photographs of his fiance's niece wearing sort of some of the same things and holding, I think she had spoons or knives stuck <laughs> between her fingers or something or whatever. Um, and so I kind of based the character on that. And the doctor that was in that episode was based on his fiance. That's so cool. That's funny. So, so but you know, no, I mean, no, I, you could have knocked us over to think that this character would have become as huge as, I don't even think Fred could have imagined that. That she would be so huge, but you know, she's it's amazing. Bigger than ever now in the comics. Yeah. She's, I mean, Cody, I mean, as you know, she was just an exterminator. She's killing it on the Krakoan X Men. I'm mean, everyone. She's had, she's had so many defining, defining arcs right now, even just as part of different teams, let alone a few years ago. She was the all new Wolverine. Yeah. It's, uh, did you, did you know she was going to be in Logan? The movie before I, I, think, I, think we had, I think we had heard that that was happening um didn't know much more about it than that and i was very pleased overall with how she came off i i wish yeah. they hadn't introduced all those other kids frankly. yeah i think that kind of uh undermined the whole idea of who she was um you know obviously the idea is that she was the 23rd clone of Wolverine, mm-hmm. the others didn't succeed or whatever, and I think we kind of played that out a lot more in Wolverine and the X Men, which yeah. is us trying to nail that down more. And Craig was also involved heavily in that. Um, but yeah, I, I really thought it, the actress did a great job, and I thought the storytelling was wonderful. And Logan, 
But yeah, like I said, other than that third act stuff with the other kids, I thought it, it was a home run all the way. So, but so no, no idea what's over there going to do. And of course, because yeah, we yeah. were paid employees at the time, they're not going to give us any credit or anything like that. What's over? I think Craig was involved, but that was because he transitioned into the MCU at that point, I think, or something. So. So on the flip side of Laura Kinney, who's had a very long lasting legacy, there is a there is a, a different <laughs> original character that has kind of kind of faded oh. away. And I, I'm always reminded once he's doing, you know, a kickflip and an Ollie while shooting his titular yeah. spikes out of his hand. <laughs> so just a, a few like what's what's the down and dirty on Spike? What was the creation process like? What happened to him? And just what was what's the behind the scenes of Spike? Well, he was one of the characters created, I believe, in the Bible, from what I gather, as just one of the core members or whatever. And it was a way to introduce another person of color yeah. into the show, which made sense. I, I know the fans were pretty upset over the fact that they, we were recreating uh, a familiar Marrow. Uh, line for uh, uh, Storm. I don't think mm -hmm. they were very happy about that whatsoever. I don't know that he, he needed to be her nephew, but you know it, it worked out in some ways, I guess. Um, but he was a lot of trouble. We we could not come up with a power for him. The, the one that I think the the person that wrote the Bible gave him was he was an armadillo. He could turn into uh, like an armadillo or something, roll up into a ball and knock people over and we thought, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> that. That is not happening whatsoever. So we tried all types of different things. Um, and finally, we ended up with him growing these bony spikes and everything. And it wasn't until much later that we found out that there was a character that already had that mural. Yeah, yeah. And I guess she, he, she was kind of a new character at that point or something. So I don't know if, if some accidental cross-pollination happened or what. Yeah, on, she but... was becoming prominent in the comics at the time with yeah. Zero Tolerance and the Twelve. So yeah, but we we had didn't know anything about her. So uh, anyway, so we created that character and just we didn't quite know what much to do with him. And you know, obviously we, he, he was in at that time. I think he was a very <laughs> the fans did not like him whatsoever. I, I, now I see that there are a lot of people who did like him. Found out yeah, more recently. That was, that was my younger sibling's fa favorite character. Oh, oh cool. Why, so yeah. I guess there was something that struck. I mean, he was definitely a hipper character than any of the other. He was a fun things. design. I, I never yeah. understood the level of hate geared mm -hmm. towards Spike. I, yeah. it, it, it was baffling for me because, again, when you watch the series now, he's a fine character. He's just there. It's, it's a different yeah. iteration of the X-Men, but he got all of that hate. And yeah, then, and I, I would hope it, it wasn't because of it being a yeah. black character. But, oh, no, no, no. I, I think it was yeah. more, it, it's kind of like the, what's the Homer Simpson character uh, that they create in, on Itchy and Scratchy, the Pippo or something like that? Uh, like, yeah. The, Pucho, yeah, whatever, they, something they, like that. But mm, the character worked. One of theirs. But you have like Laura, who who did, you you did, and she did very well. And it's it's interesting. It's yeah. I, I think, like I said, I think some of it had to do with the whole "how dare you touch Storm?" Oh yeah, and, and do that to her, and and plus, I think it, it almost seemed like a, a more of a pandering in Spike's case, which I was not on our part intended to be that way. I mean, other than the fact that yeah, there was an attempt at trying to de-white um, uh, X Men a little bit trying to get other characters in there. You know, I, I'm, I don't know that they could have found other characters, but, you know, that existed or not. You know, I, I was not that familiar at the time, but, you know, it, it, but it did take us a long time to kind of work up a storyline with him, obviously. I mean, in, I think it was in season three that he got that big story arc yeah. going and ended up being a Morlock or ha hanging with the Morlocks or whatever. And then he became an Armadillo. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, and then he yeah, literally like, became an armadillo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he never rolled up, did he? He never rolled up. I know. <laughs> yeah. Up, yeah. Huh. So, but yeah, I mean the the shields and the plates and stuff that was that was sort of part of the original idea when he was going to be an armadillo, but we just used it instead as a way that his power, his mutant power, had just gotten to turned him into like the elephant man, 
where it just got out of control and he could no longer face being in public or whatever, you know, that, that was sort of where we headed with it with the whole elephant man idea. So mm. it's, it's funny because there was a lot of rumors that season five would have had Emma Frost and Psylocke come join who were really big in the comics at the time. Obviously yeah. we've seen the sketches online. Can you debunk the rumors that these were original character designs for Emma and Psylocke. Yes, the, I'm glad to debunk it, and it's one of those things that come up all the time. Huh. That those were not intended for the show. They Those were a commission, an early, early commission by a fan asking what I would do with them if they were to have been in X-Men Evolution, and that's as far as it went. Um, it's you know, So I handled them as much as I could the same way, yeah, I suspect that we may not have gotten away with uh, some of the costuming. <laughs> I, I, Especially I, Psylocke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I guess, you know, I've, I've seen uh, cosplayers, you know, a few cosplayers actually use those costumes. So. Of of those designs. Yeah, yeah, yeah those designs. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Well, because so. they were so good. People were so, I remember when you had debunked that a long time ago and I had always known it, but when I started doing the podcast, everyone would DM me being like, Oh, did you see those designs for Psylocke and Emma? I'd be like, no, I, I think the, the designer just made them as a commission, you know, at, at whatever con mm -hmm. he was at. And they're like, no, no, that was really it because you saw the ending of the series. And I think the reason why people believe it was because a lot of folks who saw the, the end of the series that was so beautifully done with that flash forward. They thought these were going to be your unused story ideas. Yeah, I, I wish we had been that far ahead of ourselves. <laughs> it would have been nice. I mean, every season, we did not get any lead time up to it. We would, yeah, we would just, okay, you're hired. We have to start character design. These are the stories for this episode that you need, and these are the stories for the next episode, or the characters you need for the next episode. Uh, to think that we could have, Sat, sat down and said, okay, what characters can we include? Let's start doing stuff, development for them before the season even starts. That that was unheard of when we were working <laughs> on X-Men Evolution. You know, so I, I don't even know that they discussed season five. Mm. Uh, like I said, I wasn't there day to day any longer, but I think they knew early enough on in season four that it was done that I doubt they mentioned much. You know, there may have been some miscellaneous back and forth between Boyd and some of the writers and or the story editing stuff, but I couldn't tell you for sure whether or not there's any thought given ahead of time to the season five at this point. Usually towards the end of the season, you, you'd go in and pitch this the big story arc to the kids WB and they'd say, gee, we like that. Or you'd kick it back and forth with them or whatever and, and come up with what it should be and what, but I don't think they'd gotten to that point. So I wish we had, but, it, you know, and that, who knows, maybe one of these days. On that wish, I wish we had note, besides Psylocke and Emma, are there any other expanded, just not even limited to X-Men, but Marvel Universe characters that you would have liked to have designed in the X-Men Evolution version? We got to see Captain America, Nick Fury, but are there any from that expanded? You're like, that would have been cool if I got to adapt them to the, yeah, I, I, I think it would have been fun to have a Black Widow in there. Oh, yeah. Um, um, yeah, and of course, obviously, Emma and Psylocke would have been fine and uh, would have been cool, especially Emma. I, th I think she could have definitely uh, driven a wedge in there. If we <laughs> she would have shook right things there. up so well. Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, especially, Cody, with what you were saying during that time when yeah. Morrison, when they were writing Emma... Emma revolutionized a lot of the X-Men at yeah. the time. So if you would have brought her into evolution, mm -hmm. man, I, w I wonder what role she could have played. Like, yeah. No, it would have been fun to uh, kind of dig into that because that, that would have been a new angle to come at it from, especially her being a woman and stuff and uh, a rival. You know, and Scott easily manipulated, of course. So. <laughs> Can I ask a question? What do you think a revival would look like today? For X Men Evolution, well, you mean if they continued it like they are doing the nineties yeah. nineties show? Yeah. Would you well, would, would you flash forward? Would you pick up where you left off? You know, it, I think it would be good to stay in the basic high school mode. Uh, you know, 
obviously some of the characters were graduating, but I, I think I wouldn't take it too far for it. I wouldn't leap into that future version right away. I would let the let the audience kind of sit and simmer and wait to see what when we got to certain parts of it and stuff. You know, I think we could have gone with uh, X twenty three and done a, a nice arc with her and gotten her. In. Probably wouldn't have gone where they did with the comics initially, uh, with the whole uh, uh, child hooker thing. Or no, oh, yeah, the NYX. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but um, there's um, there's I, I would have liked to have gone further with some of those storylines. Like definitely, I think I think we would could have gotten some of the recruits back into the show. I think. I mean, it was, it, come season three, we dropped a lot of them just because. It, it made sense story wise, and we just found that it was just too difficult to give them enough time, screen time, to yeah. make it worth the while of having them on. Uh, but I think Jubilee could have come back, and Bobby would have been important to have made more of a sandwich out of him. But, you know, there's definitely things we could have done that. But I wouldn't jump ahead, I think. If I were involved, I think I'd say, no, no, let, let's. You know, we've got a couple that graduated, but let's keep the ones that are still in high school finishing off high school. I think that's what was relatable and good, and it kind of kept that whole high school uh, romance, you know, cliquey vibe going and stuff. I think that was a good part of the show. So, can I ask has has there been officially any talks of reviving the series? No, if there have been, not to me that I've heard. <laughs> I mean, I, I know uh, a lot of the people who come up to me, and it might just be the bubble I'm in, the X Men Evolution bubble. That a lot, I know a lot of people saying, I didn't, I, I don't know anyone who wanted a continuation of the other series. That kind of wrapped. I, I was kind of hoping they'd do this or Wolverine and the X Men. They were going to continue something, but Wolverine and unfinished. The, yeah, Wolverine and the X Men. There's so many people who wanted that series to be revisited. I'm torn, and I'm Cody. I'm curious on your perspective on it. I just, I think evolution ended on such a beautiful note. This idea that the X Men will always have, you know, these the these enemies coming after them. That Gene would go into Dark Phoenix, Project Wide Awake would awaken. Yeah, the characters would live on. But there was a sense of hope in it, and it was such a perfect ending. But then on the same on the other side of the shoe here, or coin, excuse me. You want to see those stories built up to those stories just because the characters were so fleshed out and well realized. What's so hard, I think, about the ending of X Men Evolution is it is it is so hopeful of yeah. of the the X Men are this e eternal story that's going to always have variations and but the X Men Evolution interpretations of these stories, what you guys did seem is just it's so good that it's like I want to see their version of Dark Phoenix, I want to see their version of Emma coming, and I yeah. want to see their version of them leading a a team in a distant future, and so I think that's where it's like if a revival would happen, like it would be cool to explore, especially with how many new you know 20 plus years of x-men storytelling Material, that exists yeah. now like sure. what would your team do with that is just it's it's exciting in the same way that x-men uh, x-men 97 coming back is really exciting because i'm like what are they going to adapt <laughs> i, I want to see sure oh but, but that ending gives me chills yeah, yeah you know cody the, the ending where it, it not the actual ending itself but when xavier's finally freed from apocalypse and he looks at gene and his face just falls because he had seen, I mean, the pacing of the story, the, the direction you, you guys just knew how to hit all of those proper character notes. Well, that was more of our thing that we were trying to, we, like I said, we weren't interested in the fights because the fights yeah. are like, who cares? Bad guy, good guy, you know, whatever, but you know, hit bang, laser zap, whatever. It was about how they treated each other and how they interacted and stuff. That was where we were focusing most on. And making sure that we had those moments that you definitely felt that these were real people. I mean, that's why when we did the voice acting, also we we didn't have them yelling constantly like um, in the first series. You know, almost every line that's delivered in that series is a yell. You know, everyone's you know talking way up here and shouting and stuff. And like, no, we had to constantly pull the actors down and say, no, no. Talk like a normal person. Bring it down here, like you're talking to the person in front of you, and stuff. And and that's you know. And we also did 
things on, on that note that we it, we uh, got rid of that fake German Nazi accent for Kurt. We did not do that. I mean, we, we were huh. definitely against that thing. And, you know, I got a friend who was from Germany that I was you know, an animator friend that had uh, lived over here for years and stuff. It was German, still spoke with an accent, obviously. I said, could you read these lines and we can feed these to the actors, and let them hear them so they can hear what a, a, a real German action, accent, European accent should sound like as opposed to, you know, sounding like you're on Hogan's Heroes or something. You know? <laughs> Uh, yeah. We were all about the moments, and we'd give room for those moments to exist between the characters and the pauses and stuff, as opposed to, okay, we have, you know, they can say something, but it's got to be in the middle of a battle, or, you know. Yeah. It, it, that, that care feels there. And I guess my question follow up to that is like, do you feel like evolution paved the way for animation in general? Um, just with, I definitely say, even what you guys did, I, I guess I mean more like televised storytelling wise, like Young Justice, a DC version of a, a sidekick based superhero show has very similar long character moments sometimes without action until that that final act or um, yeah, just in general, I guess, what do you feel like X-Men Evolution's legacy is for, for superhero um, animation? Well, well I, don't, I don't know if uh, Greg Weisman what had evolution in mind or not? It could be. I really thought about that. Um, I, I never asked him, um, and I doubt he'd ever admit it if he did. <laughs> but uh, it, it's possible. I, I think our lasting contribution is the fact that we brought a lot more fans into it, especially female fans, into uh, the world of comics and comic conventions and stuff. I, I think. You, you can, I know, I, and like I said, maybe it's just a bubble I'm in, the X Men Evolution no, bubble. It, but it most certainly is not. It, if that if is you look at the, you, you look at the years before X Men Evolution at those comic conventions, and it's a woman, or girl, or whoever there is an oddity. Whereas now, it, I'd say it, they may even overwhelm the number of guys there at this yeah. point. And I think a lot of it has to do with X Men Evolution and, and other shows as well. But I think. X-Men was talked to a lot of them and that's what got them interested in it. They realized it wasn't just about fighting and stuff. So, which is, I think what a lot of the superhero shows were doing at the time and whatnot. It's just, and some of the movies fall into that trap too. I think the DC movies really fall into that trap where it's just, it's gotta be a big battle. <laughs> Why are they fighting now? Right? Huh. Who cares? And you just take a nap while they're fighting and then wake up and see who won and, you know, <laughs> well, it, I mean, it's so we were both at WonderCon. There were so many goth rogues there, and yeah. I was just at MegaCon, and I encountered four goth rogues. Oh, did you at okay. MegaCon down in Orlando? So I agree with you that that generation was very much drawn in by X Men Evolution. Did you? Um, you said this earlier. You said that X Men Evolution beat out Pokemon in the ratings. Yeah, it took <sighs> us about a season. But at that point, so Pokemon wild. was the biggest thing on their wild. network. Wild, yes. And then, you know, we, they said, well, if you can at least not lose most of the audience, we'd be happy. Because we came <laughs> on, I think, after Pokemon. And I think it, I think by season two, we were beating Pokemon. So, which it, it floored them. And, that, you know, that had a lot to do with the fact that well, I think, I think even by the end of season one, maybe we, it was obvious what was going to happen, I guess, because you know, originally our director from Kids WB was, no, 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 we don't want to have soap opera stuff between the characters. The kids <laughs> are still too young to understand that type of storytelling and whatever. But we slipped it in, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that we weren't showing them mathematics. We were giving them piles of uh, storyboards to review, and so they couldn't tell what we were doing, really. And so, so by the times the sh you know we slipped in a lot of stuff that wasn't in if they if it's, it wasn't in the dialogue, they didn't know we were doing stuff uh, specifically. So we you know we do a lot of moments that were non dialogue related and stuff, and you know a lot of glances, a lot of moments between characters that were just there, and the kids obviously reacted to it. And then by season two, uh, kids WB said, oh, "Really, we want you to do more of that." 
<laughs> you know what we told you before forget that and uh and they may not even admitted that they ever told us not to do it they may have said this is our big plan we want you this is your directive is do a lot of the romance stuff and, you know high school stuff well but it it worked well it worked out you know boring was kind of the mastermind behind all that and it came off real well so Stephen, my my last question on my end that I want to ask oh, is me. about destiny because you included Irene Atler in there, and she has not never before appeared in in an adaptation, and she's such a big character for not only Rogue but for Mystique. Did you get any network notes on including someone like Irene? I don't think so. I don't think they understood her. Once again, I don't think they realized the relationships. I I think they thought she was just a caretaker. I don't think they realized that there was a relationship that was pretty obvious between uh, Rogue and, yeah. not Rogue, well, Rogue and, but Mystique and Mystique. Irene. I don't think they understood that or caught that. And if they did, they were hoping no one else would call them on it. Because mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I know that, you know, there were a lot of people that, at Kids WB that were perfectly fine with the whole LGBTQ stuff. Mm -hmm. and uh, But I think they were a little concerned of being demonstrative about it as they would have 20 some odd years ago. But I I think they let it go because we handled it in such a way that you had to know what you were seeing to see it, I think, mm -hmm. to react to it. So, yeah, it, it's just, a, I, I was thrilled with the idea. I mean, the, the one thing <laughs> that I was talking about it a while ago to uh, someone that uh, the whole risky thing, was a very strange thing that we included. Um, oh, yeah. And you know, that was, once again, us sort of saying, laying the groundwork. Like, you know, these characters don't all have to be straight and whatnot. There's definitely a thing going on. But then it's like, well, wait a minute. That's her mother, isn't it? Her father, <laughs> <Dr>. mother <laughs> that's hitting on her. So... I mean, yeah. listen, Mystique has done worse in the comics, yeah. especially. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh sure. But, you know, this is, this With is a Gambit and Sunday morning yeah. show. Yeah. 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 So, I, mean, I, I think at that point, people you know, didn't put two and two together as, as we were doing and thinking, God, are we going to get away with this? Are they going to freak out <laughs> over this thing? And that, that was one of the bigger things that we concerned ourselves with is that whole line is like, boy, I think we might be stepping over something here. <laughs> Uh, how how far in advance did anyone at the network basically like approve or disapprove an episode before it actually aired? Like post the post the uh, storyboard stage. Well, they they would be approving all the way along the line. They'd yeah. approve an outline. They'd approve the script. Uh, you know, and, and there would be a note processing. Yeah, way all the way through. You know, and, and storyboards. Well, I don't remember a lot of notes coming in on storyboards because, like I said, those are tough to look through with those yeah. days. <laughs> yeah. um, but then, you know, Boyd would, he would do the final edit and stuff, um, put together the episode and stuff. And I don't know how much note-wise they gave him at that point. Because, you know, frankly, at that point, it's hard to get things fixed or changed. I mean, it, you, a lot of it was just you have to do whatever, you know, uh, meatball surgery you can to it just to make it work because you know we we're getting overseas animation and sometimes it was good sometimes it was questionable we did have a couple of really good overseas uh, vendors that were doing the work for us but you know sometimes we'd get a c crew on a show you know they had a b and c crews and they'd rotate throughout you know they'd be overlapping and rotating and sometimes you got a, a c crew on a really bad on a really important episode like for example that whole angel's wings episode the holiday episode you know the boy wrote that lovingly and just wanted that to be something special and we they gave it one of the worst jobs and really I up, yeah i ended up having to go back in and redraw a lot of stuff and send it back to them and, as just unacceptable you know, we, I went in and redid a lot, of, especially all the stuff between Scott and Rogue at the diner and stuff like that. You know, they just weren't getting the acting we needed. So I had to go in and do a lot of that and send it back to them and tell them to you know, follow these drawings and such. And it, it still, 
some of the animation is still on the weaker side compared to mm -hmm. some of them, but you know, that helped a lot. You know, at least it wasn't it wasn't to the point where it's like, ah, this is awful. I can't tell what they're supposed to be thinking now. Mm -hmm. or, it, it, but there was an approval process at okay. every step of the way, some form or another. Stephen, where can folks at home connect with you? Uh, I'm on the internet. Uh, yeah, I've got a website, which is basically my portfolio for people. Uh, but they more, more than glad to, they can check it out at stephenegordon.com. And I'm on Facebook. I've got a, a art page on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram. Uh, most, you know, they're all pretty much interchangeable to some degree. I'm also on LinkedIn, but, you know, that's a professional. <laughs> but uh, but uh, Facebook and you know, Instagram, if they want to connect with me, whatever, they're more than welcome to. You know, I'm pretty easy to find, I think. So, do you have what, what projects do you have coming up? Uh, I I did I just finished a few months ago a uh, character design gig. One I was just one of several character designers on a uh, Marvel animated show that has not been announced yet, so I can't discuss that. Oh, and, oh, and it's not X Men Evolution. X Men Evolution. That. I can tell you that it is <laughs> it's not X Men Evolution. Evolution. So. Is it X Men ninety seven now? X Men ninety seven. Yeah. No, that's been announced. Yeah, so. That's been. Oh, okay, it's if not been that announced. In case I could tell you, but no, yeah. it's, it's a show that has not been announced yet. And I'm working on a. Uh, currently, I'm directing on a uh, Disney Junior show for a uh, studio called Wild Canary, and it has also has not been announced yet, so I can't tell you <laughs> on that. But it, it's basically sort of a preschool show, so okay. with very. Uh, um, this is X Men Babies. Yes, that's it. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Mutant babies. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, yeah, I think the closest thing they got to that was that uh, funky Avengers show done around the, the same time as Avengers superhero show or yeah, superhero yeah, squad. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I've seen I've seen more of those episodes than I care to admit. <laughs> <laughs> 